Let's see if that's on. Is that working? I'm excited Sandy's in the front row. She and I love hanging out. It's echoey. Let's she shook her head. No, we don't love hanging out. Let's pray. Oh we do. All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, be with us as we seek you to be renewed and redeemed in our hearts and minds so that we can fully commit to your service for one another, for this generation, and those coming. In your holy name, amen. So today we're going to be talking about Timothy. I, I tried to get a sermon around the gospel lesson, but for whatever reason it just didn't um, do much for me. Is that okay to say? All, all scripture is great and for whatever reason didn't connect with it. But what I did connect with was the second lesson of Timothy. And, and Paul is talking to Timothy, encouraging him uh, to move in his faith, to move in his ministry, and to be dedicated and fully committed to it. So I kind of did a little research on Timothy. Uh, his, may, his name means honoring God. And he was, he was born in Asia Minor in Roman-occupied Lystra. And he was born of a Jewish mother and a Greek father. Um, and his, his mother actually became a Christian. And I don't know if that was before he was born, after he was born, but regardless, she became a follower of Christ. Maybe that had a good impact on him when he met Paul. So Paul, on his second journey to that region, um, spoke. He proclaimed, he evangelized to that group of people. And so Timothy began following him along with Silas. And they obviously went for some time, much like Jesus and the disciples, um, encouraging and preaching and teaching and, and healing the people that they were evangelizing to. And then eventually Timothy, obviously we know, stuck with it, right? He wasn't a fair-weather Christian. He didn't follow Christ for a time and then disappear. Uh, but he eventually became the first Christian ba- bishop, Baptist, that would be great too, the first Christian bishop in Ephesus, uh, dying around 95 AD. So he put in his time. And he obviously took to heart the words that, that Paul told him in the, in the second letter of Timothy. So Paul tells him, um, pretty soon I'm going to be dying. So after the lesson today, you see that, that Paul is saying that his life is being poured out like a drink offering. Pretty soon that his physical life and his physical ministry will end. So there's probably a big wait for Paul to make sure that his ministry is carried on uh, with Timothy. And more importantly, that Jesus' ministry is carried on. So in the lesson we see Paul saying, preach the word. Be prepared in all seasons, in seasons of growth, in seasons of hibernation. And he tells him to correct, rebuke, and encourage, which I like that. Correct, I don't like rebuke so much, but I like encourage. Uh, And then Paul, with great insight, says, do all these things with great patience and careful instruction. It's very easy to correct people impatiently. It's very easy to rebuke people with with no careful instruction. It's very easy to encourage people that we like. But I think Paul was telling Timothy that that if you're going to be an evangelist, if you're going to carry on this message, these are the things that you need to do. But Paul had great experience in life. And so he also knew the reality of ministry uh, because it's not always easy, if ever. And it's never perfect uh, because ministry deals with people. It's easy to encourage and, and teach and all those things, but at some point in time, if you're evangelizing, you can't control people, right? Nor would we want to. You can't force somebody uh, to accept Jesus, and you can't force someone to follow him in their life. So Paul, knowing this, also tells them that there's going to be a time where culture overtakes Scripture. There's going to be a time where we turn our ears away from the Lord and start following our own desires, And it's easy, I'm sure Paul was probably discouraged at times, and Timothy was discouraged at times, but Paul told him that's what culture's going to do, and we can't always change that. So continue in your ministry. And oftentimes it's really easy to point at culture. Many of you here have have lived more generations than I have, and so you've experienced kind of the flip-flop of culture and the way the pendulum swings in terms of Christ being in the schools versus out of the schools, and, and you've seen churches change. Right? In all those things, Jesus still reigns. It's very easy to point at culture, but as I look at my own self and my own life, oftentimes I resemble, resemble more culture than Christ. Sometimes I get a little uh, misdirected. Sometimes selfishness takes over my life. Sometimes I get tired of, of preaching the word or encouraging or praying, or sometimes I just want to do what I want to do. And so Paul is encouraging Timothy and, and us as well that at some point in time, Culture's going to sway us. Culture's going to try to misdirect us 
And, and that's part of our problem. Yet, Paul says very clearly again, with clarity and experience and God's insight, that life's realities and the rela- realities of evangelist is to always keep our head in all situations. That we have to have an eternal perspective. I don't know if you guys have been watching presidential debates. You guys want to talk about those now? No, they're, no, right? So Sonia and I will sit down and we'll watch the, the various news channels to see everyone's perspectives. And, and the other night that we were watching it and we're sitting there and we're happy, kids are to bed and we're relaxed and hanging out and then pretty soon the tone of our time turned a little bit like a pit in her stomach. Does that make sense? She's watching this. She's saying, what is wrong with our culture? What is wrong with America? What is wrong with these candidates? What is wrong with how we handle disagreements? And so we started talking about that, and we realized that that oftentimes we can get a little bit swayed by the movement of culture. But the great thing about Christ is he's not moved by culture. He's not moved by candidates. He's not moved by wars. He's not moved by all these things. In fact, Jesus is the same that he always was, and his message is still the same today as it was with Timothy, that we need to proclaim the gospel, and we need to have an eternal perspective. He also told Timothy, he said, endure hardship. I'm sure everyone here has endured some type of hardship in their life, either something they feel God allowed in their life, or maybe something someone did to you unjustly much like the the widow in the gospel lesson. Or maybe something that you did to yourself. Your own actions put you in a situation where you felt despair and brokenness. Regardless of who caused it, Paul is telling Timothy to endure hardship because it's temporary. Again, with that idea of that eternal perspective. And in fact, hardship in Scripture says that when you endure hardship, it actually produces an authentic and a real and genuine faith. That it has to finish its work, but you have to be patient through it. Then Paul also tells Timothy, do the work of, of an evangelist. As we know, the work of an evangelist is never a clock in, clock out, right? It's a lifelong commitment. I think we all know people who have committed their life to serving for the Lord. And they go to different countries. I think, Bob, you have a sister in a place called, help me out, Papua New Guinea. And she does what? Okay, for the ELCA, correct? Right. So she's committed her life to that call. Pastor Steve has committed his life to that Paul. Pastor Hagen committed his life to the call. But the reality that I think Paul is telling all of us is that we are all evangelists, that we're all responsible for sharing the gospel, and it's never done. And the part that I like at the end of that, he says, carry out, discharge, empty your ministry fully. I like that. I don't know if you guys do house projects ever. Sonia tells me I'm good at 97% of the project. Is that true for anybody here? I'm really good up until the last 3% that makes the project fully completed. And so last night she went out um, and got some new curtain rods because ours were coming off the walls because cats were crawling up them and kids were hanging on them, swinging from them, right? And the project we wanted to get done... And I didn't want to put the rods up last night, but I could tell that 3% that she was hoping I would finish was last night. So last night I'm drilling in the wall. She's saying, be quiet, the kids are trying to sleep. I said, I'm trying to finish the project. So I couldn't really win. But the point is, this morning, as the curtains were fully closed, keeping out the light, I said, how do you like them? She goes, it's nice to have it completed, done fully completed. I think that's what Paul's telling Timothy, that in ministry, there's never an opportunity where we can say, you know, I've done 70% of the work, I think I'm good now, or I've put in enough time and energy uh, for this person, I think I want to walk away now. When it comes to evangelism, when it comes to ministry, there's never opportunity where we can say, I'm done. And the same thing is for true, true for Paul. Even in the last breath, his ministry was still in full effect. He was fully committed. So it got me thinking about Ministry and evangelism. So for you, think for a second. What is your ministry? You're going to think for a second. Some of you, like Pastor Steve, committed to to ministry. That's what he's doing for his his job, his occupation, and also the love of his life. So that's what he's doing. So for you, what's your ministry? What's your ministry? As an individual, what is your ministry? And as a family, you're sitting next to people that you know, and, and you go home to people you know, and you have friends and family. What is 
the, the role, what is the ministry, what is the message that, that your family is sharing to the world? And then think in context of a church, what is Pilgrim's ministry? We live it out in a variety of different ways, but what is the ministry of Pilgrim Lutheran Church in this community? We probably have different views on how that's lived out, but there's a central message, hopefully, that we're living out. So if you want, turn to Colossians with me. Colossians 3 and 4. So I got to thinking about ministry. What is ministry? Because some of us have occupations. Some are retired. Some are committed to the ministry. Some are stay-at-home moms. Some are retired. All those things. What is the point? So in chapter 3, verse 2, it says, Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Then closing out chapter 4, It says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. And I love this part. It's underlined in in this Bible. It says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. That's our ministry, right? It's our ministry to do that in every opportunity, when it's convenient and when it's not convenient, when we want to and when we don't want to. That is God's call for us. And it's in response, when we find Christ, that's our response for one another. So I don't know if you guys have been to Costco before. I've seen many of you at Costco. If you know me, I love Costco. When I leave in the morning for work, Hattie says, where are you going? I say, I'm going to work. She goes, are you going to Costco? Are you going to Costco? Because she knows I love to take them to Costco, especially on days like this. I have them run down the aisles as I'm getting stuff. They run around, make the loops, get all that energy out, and their little squeaky feet are running down, and they're running into people's carts. So if you see my kids at Tacoma Costco, I apologize because they won't go with the flow of Costco traffic. Because there's a certain style that you do there. But I love Costco. I love it so much. And if somebody asks, what do you love about Costco? I just I love the whole thing. You get a, a dollar fifty for a hot dog that'll probably kill you, but it's a dollar fifty and you get a free pop. Or you see the pizza, you see how they make the pizza with the sauce on that, that machine that shoots it out. Love Costco. But I go tell everybody how much I love Costco all the time. That that comes out of my mouth because it's in my heart. I love Costco. But in terms of how much I'm willing to tell about how much I love Jesus, those things sometimes are disconnected. I'm fully committed to Costco. I pay a membership. They take all my money every month. Fully committed to it, and I share about it. But when it comes to my relationship with Jesus, I'm sometimes hesitant because I don't want to offend somebody, overstep a boundary. I'm hesitant to be that evangelist in the life of other people, a sincere evangelist to other people. So I'm not always fully committed to that. So sometimes I'm focused on the temporary, Costco, or fill in the blank. Somebody told me before, make your sermon short. There's a Seahawks game, and I get that. But the Seahawks are pretty temporary, right? Especially if they don't make it past the Super Bowl, right? (laughs) Temporary. All those things land. All the things that I tend to focus on in my own life, a car payment, a house payment, even health, even uh, leisure time, a vacation, all those things are temporary in comparison to the eternal greatness of our God. So sometimes I'm caught in that that difficulty, serving me versus serving God, serving one another. But here's the great thing about God is that he loves us anyways. He knows every one of our faults, all the things that we fear, all the things that we fall short in, all the areas of our life that we're broken. He knows those. And he loves us anyways. And in fact, our brokenness and our weakness is exactly what is possible for him to use us. See, Jesus was so irritated with the teachers of the law, the the Pharisees, the the people that were in with God. He was so irritated because it became more about them and their goodness than about God and his greatness. And sometimes we fall into that same thing, is that we're afraid to share about what God's doing in our life because we know that we're hypocrites. Or we're afraid to tell somebody about an area of our life that we really messed up because it might look bad on us. We might be bad Christians. But in fact, when we use our brokenness, when we use the errors of our life, to influence somebody else, God is, God is light. He's shown. He's full of that. And he's excited about it. That's evangelism. 
So we know what evangelism is. We know the things that we're committed to that get in our way. And then we also need to know where our ministry is. So for you, where is your ministry? We already know what it is to share the gospel, but where is your ministry? Where is your ministry? You don't need to be a pastor to share the gospel. It's just a different title. We all have the same access to Jesus. We all have the same access to the word. We all have the same access to to worship and pray to him. So where is your ministry? If you're really to look at that, where you are today, all your faults, all the areas that you've failed, all your fears, all your despair, all your brokenness, all your depression, all your anger, all your sin, all those things God can use for his ministry, for his purpose, to share the gospel. And you look at scripture, they were a bunch of mess-ups, right? And in fact, even look at the widow. She was somebody of no worth, of no value, of no purpose in that society. And even today, there are societies that still exist like that. But she had, she had no worth. And yet she approached the unjust judge over and over again to say, this, can you fix this? Can you heal this? Can you repair this? And the judge, because he was afraid that she would attack him, said, sure, I'll fix that. But how greater is God if he is willing to use all the brokenness that we have to to evangelize to this world, to encourage this world? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that we are not as successful and put together as we think we are. We know that we're not Christians that that have all the answers. But you've called us, just like Timothy, uh, to share your gospel, to do it sincerely, Uh, to do it with power and to do it with grace. And so we just pray this week that we would know what our ministry is, we'd know the roadblocks to it, and we'd, more importantly, know where our ministry is and how best to love those around us. In your holy name, amen.